So, good morning. I'm Pastor Jay Beckley from Stone Creek Bible Church in Temecula, California. And I'm delighted to be able to spend a few minutes with you this morning in God's Word. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 3, the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. And uh, I hope that you will join me there in Luke chapter 3 as we take a look at Jesus' story of his family. And it's a pretty amazing story. So, this morning, one of the things that uh, we will see in Jesus' genealogy is that God's perspective on the world is so much bigger than our perspective. Like when I think of God in, in work, at work in my life, I think of maybe a few days or a week ahead, uh, maybe a month or a few years, but we're going to look at a genealogy that spans over 2,000 years. And this morning, I think one of the things that we should get from this small passage of Scripture is a new perspective on how God looks at the world. So let's jump into the genealogies of Luke. And before we re start reading, I want to just give you a few uh, clues. There are two genealogies of Jesus. One is in Matthew chapter 1, and this one is in Luke chapter 3. And these genealogies are different. And so one of the things we want to talk about is why the genealogies are different. And Luke paints that picture for us. And so let's jump in uh, to the genealogy of Jesus in verse 23 of Luke chapter 3. We read, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age. And so that's a little detail that only Luke provides for us. None of the other gospel writers tell us how old Jesus was when he started his ministry. Now, that was a common age for leaders in Jesus' time. Now, this shows a remarkable patience and maturity in Jesus' life. There was no rush. There was no desperation. He wasn't in a panic to save the world. He knew that God had a plan and that if he was faithful to that plan, he was going to be able to do everything that God had planned for him. <clears throat> now, this statement about Jesus' age also links the genealogy with the birth narratives, and the role of John, which ends with statements about Jesus' baptism, the voice of God, and the temptation in the wilderness. And if you go back a few verses in Luke's story, he tells us very briefly this summary of how Jesus went and was baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. When he came up out of the water, the heavens parted, a dove came down, and the voice of God was heard saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then Luke begins the genealogy. So... As we begin to read in verse 23, Jesus, when he began his ministry, we read, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, or Eli, depending on whether you're, what pronunciation you're using. Now, this first line is a little bit awkward. There's so many names in this list. Son of, 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 son of. The fact that Luke begins with this question mark, you know. So Jesus was the son, as was supposed, of Joseph. So there's actually a Greek word in there that kind of brings Joseph's fatherhood into question. Which doesn't surprise me because Luke has already discussed the virgin birth of Mary. And the fact that Joseph didn't have a physical relationship with Mary before Jesus was born. Luke goes into great detail about this. And so for him to begin the genealogy with this question mark seems reasonable to me. Then he moves on to a list that doesn't have any question marks. Son of Heli. Let's see. We can read in, in verse uh, 24. The son of Mat Matat. The son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jonah, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maath, the son of Matathias, the son of Samin, the son of Josek, the son of Jodah. Now in Hebrew, the letter J is often pronounced Y, and so we see that in the, the name of God, Yahweh. And we also see it here, where Joda would be pronounced Yoda in Hebrew. Now, I don't know who this guy is. But I know that this Hebrew name, Yoda, um, was probably the inspiration for a Jedi Knight character in the Star Wars series. Yoda, you know. And most of us have that image in our mind. And uh, this is probably where it comes from. 
You know, guys like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg were just reading through the Old Testament looking for crazy names, and they came across this name, Yoda, which means one who knows. You know, it's very ominous. And the fact that it's included in the genealogy of Jesus is probably totally irrelevant to our discussion, but I couldn't resist bringing that up. Verse 27, the son of Joanan, the son of Reza, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melki, the son of Adi, the son of Kosam, the son of El Elmadam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Jorim, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Mele, the son of Mina, the son of Matata, the son of Nathan, the son of David. So you get through all those names. And what you've done is you've connected Jesus to David. Now, all these names are different than the names in Matthew's genealogy. And there's a big question. Why two genealogies with totally different names? Well, this last verse kind of answers that question. Luke's genealogy traces Jesus to Nathan, son of David. Matthew's genealogy traces Jesus to Solomon, son of David. And so Matthew's genealogy provides perhaps the legal authority of Jesus to be Messiah as the son of David through Solomon, who was the ruling heir to David's throne. And if you study Matthew's genealogy, you discover that there's this guy, Jehoiakim, who was an evil king, and God cursed him and said, no son of yours will ever sit on the throne of David and prosper. And so there are some scholars who think that that curse kind of shuts off the line of Solomon. But because Jesus was not the biological son of Joseph, he was the virgin-born son of Mary, that he avoids this curse in Solomon's line. And so he becomes a legitimate heir to the throne of David because of the virgin birth. Or this genealogy in Luke traces the descendant from Nathan. There's also an explanation that comes to us from a scholar in the 1500s who suggests that this genealogy in Luke is not Joseph's genealogy, it's Mary's genealogy. Now, women weren't typically included in genealogies in, in Jewish times, but neither did women have babies without a husband. You know, this whole thing that Luke talks about, where Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, kind of changes the rules. It makes Mary's situation kind of unique, and so for her genealogy to be included by Luke is consistent with the story the way Luke tells it. And the fact that Lori, Luke probably met with Mary and heard her share the details of her experiences as the mother of Jesus. And so it would have been consistent with that narrative for Luke to provide the genealogy of Mary, which goes back through the line of David to Nathan. Now, I got to tell you, I love that connection. Because Nathan and Solomon were both sons of, a, of David and his wife Bathsheba. And you may remember that name from the story in the Old Testament where David is a bad boy and he has an affair with this young girl and uh, he takes her to be his wife and um, she gets pregnant and the, the baby that they conceive in their affair actually dies in infancy. And it is viewed as kind of the judgment of God on their sin. But after that, as a married couple, they have several children. One of them is Nathan and one of them is Solomon. And at one point... God comes to David and says, I am going to bless you, and I am going to bless you through your son Solomon, and he is going to be the heir to your throne. And so there's this amazing thing that happens, and God is involved in it, and it's almost as if God is saying, I have forgiven your sin, I am no longer holding this indiscretion against you, and I am going to bless you even in this relationship with this young woman that you had an affair with before you were married. And I have just always loved that. It's like, boy, God, he knows us where we are. He accepts us where we are. And he forgives us um, readily. And I love this little genealogical connection because um, it tells me that if God is going to use an alternate genealogy, he still brings that back to a child of Bathsheba. It's like God doesn't forgive their sin and, and bless them through Solomon and then take that away. 
you know, he restores that connection through their other son and Bathsheba remains in the genealogical line of Jesus either way you go. And I love the fact that when God makes those kind of changes or when God, you know, puts an alternate plan in place, he does it in a way that doesn't take away the privilege and the blessing that he's already given to people. Then in uh, verse 27... Uh, we just read that. Um, verse 32, the son of Jesse. So David was the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz. And that reminds me of the story of Ruth in the book of Ruth. Boaz was the, the older man who took this young woman under his, uh, under his wing, sort of, and protected her as she worked in the fields and, and then married her and then uh, raised children by her and became the great-great-grandfather of David. And Boaz is the son of Salah, the son of Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah. And Judah was the son of Jacob. He was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And Judah is the tribe that the Messiah was supposed to come from. And so this genealogy traces Jesus' lineage back to Judah. But if you remember the story of Judah, he wasn't a good boy either. You know, he was going off to work in the sheep field, shearing the sheep. And uh, he came to a crossroads on his way out to the fields, and there was a young woman there who had a little tent set up, and she was offering her services to the men who were passing by. And uh, her name was uh, Tamara. So Judah stops in, and he spends some time with Tamara, and he doesn't have any money. And so he leaves his signet ring and his staff. And uh, a few months later, she's pregnant, and the men of the village bring her out and, and want to stone her. And... Uh, she says, wait a minute, wait a minute, you can't stone me because the man who's the father of this child is the man whose staff and whose signet ring I have. And she literally had jo Judah's signet ring, <laughs> the ring he would use to, to seal documents with his official um, seal as a wealthy landowner, la landowner and a son of Abraham. And so Judah is embarrassed by this, of course, and he takes her under his wing and he marries her. He takes her to be his own wife and uh, raises other children with her. And so she's part of this story of forgiveness, crazy forgiveness. Like God doesn't have any boundaries around the forgiveness that he gives to people who come to him. And I just love that part of this story. Then Judah, the son of Jacob, and Jacob and all his problems, we were reminded of, you know, his two wives, Rachel and Leah, and they're, they're fighting over how many children that they would have and the whole story of Jacob. And then there's Isaac, whose name means laughter because his mother laughed at God when God told her she was going to have a son, <laughs> Isaac. And then he was the son of Abraham. And Abraham was the man that God said, come and follow me. I'm going to show you a land and I'm going to give you that land. And I want you to go out and walk around and I'm going to give you every piece of land that your foot steps on. And so Abraham is a, is a channel of blessing from God to the entire world. And then Abraham is connected to Terah, his father. And if you read Genesis, you discover that Terah was a quitter. Uh, God had called him to go to the promised land, and he set out from his hometown in Ur of the Chaldees to go to the promised land, but he, but he found a nice village on the way, and he decided to settle down, and he stayed there for a while, and then he never went to the promised land. And then God called Abraham his son. And so there's amazing stories that are kind of compacted into this brief passage. And he was the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Selah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, and we remember the story of Noah from Genesis. The son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the oldest man who ever lived. The son of Enoch, the man who walked with God and was not, for God took him. The son of Jared, the son of Mahaliel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And so Luke takes these, you know, 20 some odd verses and basically helps us understand who Jesus is by telling us the whole story of all the people that are part of his lineage all the way back to Adam, the son of God. And so Luke is really building a, building a connection here between his readers, all of his readers, his Greek readers, his Roman readers, people that were not Jewish. They could follow this genealogy and they could see, oh my goodness, Jesus is being traced all the way back to the beginning of the story. And so all of us are part of this same family tree with Jesus. 
And so Luke is doing some amazing things here in this uh, genealogy. He's uniting the north and south of Israel, which were divided. He's uniting, he's uniting Israelites with Gentiles and people who were not Jewish. He's uniting Romans with Greeks. He's, he's really, in this genealogy, he's building a huge bridge for the people who are going to read his gospel and learn about Jesus to really understand that Jesus wasn't just an idea that God came up with. He wasn't just a flash in the pan. He just didn't appear out of nowhere. That he was part of a plan that God had all the way back to Adam. 4,000 years or more. And so the God that we worship, the God who, who sent Jesus to the earth, is a God who plans over 4,000 years of time. You know, we sometimes talk about business planning in decades, and the Chinese brag about planning in centuries. Well, our God is a God who plans in millennia. He plans in thousands of years, not just months and weeks and days. And so I love that feeling of God being in control of not only Jesus and his family and the Jewish people, but God being in control of the whole world. Now, ultimately, I see in this journey through Jesus' family tree, men and women who need a savior, men and women that are able to turn to God and find direction and purpose. And most of them were not superheroes. They were just typical people. We don't even know anything about what they've done except just their names. And yet they were important to God. They were important enough to include in this 4,000-year plan. They served God in daily faithfulness. They raised families. They went to church. They worked in the fields. They worshiped. They helped people in need. They obeyed God and God's instructions, and they trusted God's promise. They were just like us. Some of them were godly, and some of them were evil. And God still loves them. And I love that because it reminds me of the verse that talks about Jesus who came to the earth to save sinners, to save sinners. You know, do, do you have black sheep in your family? <laughs> I've got black sheep in my family. Oh, my goodness. I can just go back two or three generations, and there's some really black sheep in my family. And uh, I love that because Jesus had black sheep in his family, some really black sheep, black sheep in his family. And so when Jesus was trying to figure out who I am, you know, he would look at this genealogy and realize, oh, I am the descendant of some really bad sinners, you know, and yet God still loves them. And I have a mission and a purpose, and I am here to save sinners. Think about somebody who's evil in your life. Maybe a relative who's done something bad or a business associate that you just hate because he takes advantage of you every time he can. Think about that black sheep and realize that God loves that person, that Jesus died for that person. And that our attitude and, and the way our life responds to these people should be positive. And so in a couple of weeks when we have Thanksgiving or, or don't have Thanksgiving, allow this passage to speak to your heart about how you will receive and respond to the black sheep in your family who show up with all kinds of craziness in their life. This is our opportunity to be like Jesus, to minister grace and forgiveness to people who desperately need to know that. Then I want you to ask yourself what it is like for this young woman, Mary, who seems to have been a godly woman, and yet she suffered the loss of her reputation as a teenager. She grew up and raised a family in a working-class home. She's possibly widowed in her 30s with five kids. <laughs> Joseph kind of disappears from the story of Jesus as if maybe he died. Um, while Jesus was in his 20s. And I love that because when my father passed away, I began to identify in a new way with Jesus, whose father passed away. And I realized that he understood my grief in an intimate, personal way. And then, at 46, Mary watches her precious child be crucified, be whipped, be beaten, be, have a spear shoved into his spine. Three days later, he raises from the grave. And she experiences the confusion of trying to figure out what that means about her son and about her. She sees the crowds at Pentecost believe in Jesus and be baptized. And then years later, a young physician named Luke listens to her story and writes it in a book. At about 60, she moves to Ephesus with the Apostle John and lives in a rented home on the side of a hill near a well where people come to get water every day. And tradition tells us that she would have sat there uh, near the well as a small crowd would gather, and then she would begin. <laughs> have you heard about my son? They called him Jesus. Let me tell you his story. And she would be able to recount the story of her son Jesus 
to the people that were gathered around, people who had heard John and Luke and Paul preach the gospel and wondered about those details that they couldn't figure out or the things that seemed confusing. And Mary spent the end of her life teaching new believers how to understand the scripture and teaching people that were not Christians how they could come to know Jesus, not as their crucified Savior, but as their risen Lord, as their living Lord, who sits on the right hand of God the Father in heaven and who manages the affairs of our lives. And every one of us can rest in that confidence that Jesus is on the throne, that he is in control of the circumstances that we face, and that he will not allow us to be abandoned or neglected in our pursuit of living a godly life that he will guide us and direct us, that he will empower us to do the things that God calls us to do, and that he will always be there. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And so this genealogy is a testament to the fact that God's purpose and God's plan in Jesus' life was, was a 4,000-year plan. And so when Jesus says, I'm never going to leave you, I'm never going to forsake you, you can know that, that he's looking at a 4,000-year plan a 6,000-year plan, an 8,000-year plan. We don't know when Jesus is going to come back, but we know he's going to be coming back. He promises to come back and to help us fix the mess that we have made out of our world, out of our families, out of our lives. And I am excited to be able to tell the story of how Jesus has blessed me, how Jesus has forgiven my sin, how the things that Jesus did change my attitude about my world, about my family, about my country. He gives me the opportunity to serve and to love him every day, just like the people in this list.